Hey there, this is Arthur Hill, Chief Technical Strategist at TrendInvestorPro.com. You are tuned in to Next Level Charting. Thank you very much for joining us. I appreciate it. If you're watching this video on YouTube and you like it, of course, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing. So today we're going to put the 200 day moving average to the test and we're going to do that with the S&P 500. I'm going to show you how to chart it. I'm going to show you how to smooth it and also how to chart those smooth signals on stock charts ACP. Then we're going to back test this. I'm going to show you some equity curves, some drawdown charts so you know what to expect with the different crosses that we're going to test because we're going to reduce whipsaws with a little smoothing. Then we'll take that one step further and test on the NASDAQ 100, the S&P MedCap 400, and the S&P Small Cap 600. But believe it or not, those two, two of the three, don't test very good. So we're going to see how they test just using S&P 500 signals. So let's hit the charts and the tests. So I'm going to start off on stock charts ACP so we can chart the 200-day and see price relative to the 200-day using this indicator here at the bottom. This is percent above MA. And the one here is the close, so a one-day moving average, basically. We're going to change that to five later on. 200 for the base moving average. And if you want to put a level for smoothing, you can also smooth that. If I go to the top left here, I can open up the settings there, and there's percent above moving average, and there are all the settings there that you can use. And this indicator is part of the Trend Investor Pro Indicator Edge plugin. And if you go down to the bottom right, you can click on the plug icon, and there you can see all the available plugins for Stock Charts ACP. So click on Trend Investor Pro Indicator Edge if you're interested in this indicator. Plus, there are 11, 10 other indicators there, including the trend composite and the ATR trailing stop. So right now, we're just going to focus on the cross of the 200-day and SPY, which is basically the S&P 500. And if you look here, you can see that the 200-day is just a magnet for whipsaws. You can see from January here until April, we had 11 crosses of the 200-day moving average. And you can easily see those in the indicator window. When you go red, you're below. When you go green, you're above. So we got 11 moves above and below that zero line from January to April. And then we got the final move in April where we moved deep below the 200-day moving average into June. And then we came up and tested the 200-day and fell back here in the latter part of August. But the point here is that there are lots of crosses of the 200-day, and it can be a battle zone that generates a lot of whipsaws. And one period that comes to mind in particular is if I go back to 2015. And just you know, going down this chart, you can see there is a little whipsaw in March 2019, a little whipsaw in May, June 2019, more in 2018. And you got to reduce those whipsaws in your trading because otherwise you're going to go nuts if you're trying to trade every little cross of the 200-day. And, and here's 2015. You know, we get these whipsaws in the summer, and then we break down, and then we get whipsaws there in November and December, a lot of them. If you look down at the indicator window, it's turning red, green, red, green, red, green as you cross. And you can't just buy, sell on every signal because you're just going to get whipsawed and it's just going to be tiring. So what you need to do is smooth that out. And just a little five-day moving average can really help smooth out those whipsaws and keep the returns where we want them. So since I ended on that 2015 period, I'm going to start with that here. So I basically shown the, I'm showing the SPY chart bars as a light gray to hide them. And I've got the five-day moving average in green. And I've got the 200-day in red. And below, I've got the 5-200 cross, basically. So you can see it's green when the 5 days above the 200-day, and then red when it's below. And we did get some whipsaws there in November and December 2015. But you can see we didn't get any in the early part of the summer. We got that cross in August. We got a few whipsaws here, but fewer than if we looked at the actual price closing above and below the 200-day. 
you can see it moved above and below the 200 day to red line several times closing above and below whereas we only had one two three crosses by just smoothing it out with a five day moving average and with stock charts acp it's real easy to scroll and just see how these signals compare there is june 2016 that was the brexit decline and we closed below the 200 day five day did not so smoothing help there uh, we touched the 200 day right there but didn't close below it i don't think uh, and then if we move further down we can see we get some closes a close below the 200 day in march 2018 but not the five day moving below the 200 day and then we got some whipsaws in october november december with the five day and with the close above and below the 200 day but fewer whipsaws by smoothing the close out with the five day moving average and now i'm just going to go to the present so we can see what's going on here with the five day 200 day combination and then we're going to put it to the test so we basically had 11 crosses from january to april just using the close and the 200 day and if we smooth that close with a five day moving average you only had five crosses so a lot fewer whipsaws and whipsaws are the name of the game because markets have been shown to trend but we have to avoid those whipsaws they're going to happen and to do that we do some smoothing so let's see how this back test when we use the buy and hold versus uh, the close crossing above and below the 200 day versus the five 200 day cross so i'm moving over to amy broker that's what i use for back testing strategies and this is just a basic strategy for the s p 500 sbdr crossing above and below the 200 day and we're going to go from 2000 1 1 2000 to august 1st 2022 and there were basically 83 signals a signal a complete signal is a buy and a sell and if you look on the price chart you can see the red arrows show across below and the green arrows show across above and so again you can see a lot of whipsaws happening just using the cross above and below the 200 day especially in the beginning of 2022 in the first four months a lot of whipsaws and if we just used a five-day moving average, as I'll show you next. So I just re-ran this using the 5-200 cross. And instead of 83 trades with just the close above and below the 200-day, when we do the 5-200 cross, we only had 31 trades, a lot fewer trades. And if you look on the price chart here, I'm not showing the close. I'm just showing the five-day moving average going below and then going above. So you had one signal in march 2020 and another signal in june 2020 and then a couple of whipsaws here you're not going to avoid the whipsaws completely and we'll show when we look at the returns whether it's better to have a short moving average or a long moving average but the bottom line is you're cutting out a lot of the whipsaws by just going to a five-day moving average now let's put some numbers on the performance so as I said at the beginning, this test is going from January 2000 to August 2022. And it's important that you, when you do a back test that you look at at least one bear market. And this one includes two bear markets, one from 2002 to 2003. And of course, the global financial crisis in 2008, 2009. And then we also have the COVID crash. We have the May flash crash, the European sovereign debt crisis in 2011. So a lot of material there to work with. So we're not just looking at one bull market, one bear market. We're looking at different market environments. And buy and hold for SPY without dividends is 4.63%, which isn't that great. And that's because you had those two bear markets in the first 10 years of this test, basically. It's in the last 10, 12 years that we've had a major bull market. And you can see here your biggest drawdown, 56.5%. And the reason we use moving averages for a little bit of timing is to reduce these drawdowns. So what I'm gonna look at next is the 5200 cross here. So you can see the return is a little bit less than the buy and hold return. Exposure drops to 70% because you're out during the bear markets. And you can see the maximum drawdown as a result goes down to 20%. And that's what that little moving average cross can do. You keep the returns, but you lower the drawdowns. 
And that's because you get out during bear markets and you preserve your cash, your capital. And there you can see the total trades. So we had 83 trades. Win rate was 35%. Not that great because of the whipsaws. And average gain much better, bigger than the average loss. So now we're going to look at the 5200 cross, the statistics here. And you can see it's a little bit of an improvement. So we can see that we have a much higher compound annual return, over 1% per year higher, 5.61%. Same exposure, maximum drawdowns about the same, 20%. And you can see we had fewer trades. We're down to 31 trades. The win rate went up to 42%. And then you can see the average gain jumped to, it almost doubled almost doubled to 14.42%, and the average loss was just over 2%. So it really pays to do that 5-200 cross versus, say, when the cross is above the 200 buy, when it crosses below the 200 sell, use that five-day to reduce those whipsaws. Now I want to show you some equity curves and drawdowns. So this is what the equity curve looks like for the 5-200 cross for SPY. You buy when the five-day cross is above, you sell when the five-day cross is below, starting at 100000 And you can see it grows, and it grows all the way to 343000 The blue line is buy and hold for reference, and it grew to 294. So you're outperforming buy and hold using that 5200 cross. And the reason you're outperforming is because you're preserving capital during bear markets. So you can see here that we had the bear market period from 2001 to 2002 when the buy and hold strategy went into drawdown, deep drawdown, but the 5200 cross was flat because you were in cash. And then when the five day moved above the 200 day, you participated in the advance. And then during the bear market of 2008, 2009, you were out flat. And then there's the big dip. So at the low of the bear market in 2008, 2009, you were below your 2002 lows as far as your equity was concerned for buy and hold. You're way underwater. And as you can see here, it wasn't until 2012 that you got above this equity high here from 2007. Whereas with the 5200 cross, you can see you're hitting new equity highs. Uh, actually, you hit one in 2010, then you hit another one in 2012. Uh, you're still going to get drawdowns. There's a drawdown there. There's another drawdown. And there's the COVID crash. But you're going to participate in broad market advances. So just for reference, here's what the buy and hold equity line looks like again. And I'm showing you this because I want to show you the drawdowns. And we're going to compare those to the 5200 cross drawdowns. There are those big drawdowns with buy and hold. If you're just buying and holding, then you can see you had two drawdowns that got to the 50% area in 2002 and in 2008 there. And then with the COVID crash, we got down to around 33% for the drawdown. Now, we haven't had a big 50% drawdown in 10 years, but that doesn't mean we can't have one. I have no idea if we're going to get one. The point is that when the five days below the 200-day, you're more likely to experience negative outcomes, a.k.a. drawdowns. So let's look at the drawdowns now for the 5200 cross here. You can see they're much different. They're first of all they're in that 12% area at the beginning of the period and then 2008, 2009 we got into the 18 to 20% area and in 2010 there with the May flash crash and then 2015, well, 16 was a tough period there you got down to that 18 20% area but you never got close to 50%. You never got below 20%, basically. And most of the drawdowns were in this 12% range. And that's where we are currently. We have a 12% drawdown, basically, uh, because the market was hit pretty hard in January, and that's when it took the drawdown. I can go to this next table here, and you can see the month by month, year by year. Uh, just go to the bottom. There you can see 2022. We can see January, February. That's the big drawdown there. And there was a little whipsaw in April. And right now, we've been in cash because the five-day has been below the 200-day. 
So the 5200 cross is one of five inputs for what I call the composite breadth model that we run here at trendinvestorpro.com. And this is a combination of trend and breadth because I'm trying to find out if we're in a bull market or a bear market because that is the single most important question that we need to answer. Because we're for in a, if we're in a bull market, then we want to look at stock-based ETFs and we want to play the beta trade. We want technology. We want offensive sectors. We want software, semiconductors. But we're, if, if we're in a bear market, then we want to be more defensive. And what I've got is I've got the composite breadth model, as I said. And that is part of the market regime page, which is updated every Wednesday at Trend Investor Pro. I also put out a video on Wednesdays and then commentaries on Tuesdays and Thursdays. We also have an ETF signal table, but briefly I'll show you the composite breadth model on the market regime page. And this again is updated every Wednesday because we need to know if we're in a bull market or a bear market. And there's the 5200 cross and then in the first indicator window, you've got the composite breadth model. And it's been bearish since April 11th here. And so it's telling us to be wary of stocks right now. We don't make predictions. We just follow what the trend and the composite breadth model say and trade accordingly. So check out trendinvestorpro.com if you want to know more about our services and strategies for trading and investing in ETFs. So I went ahead and tested other moving average combinations. In addition to the five-day crossing above and below the 200-day, I tested the 20-day and the 50-day. And the 50-day is, of course, the golden cross. And what I've done here is in the indicator window, I've put that 5200 cross. And you can see it's much smoother. You're going to get a lot fewer signals with the 5200 cross. And you can see here that the 50-day cross below the 200-day in March and we're currently in a downtrend as far as that is concerned. But there's a reason I don't quite like the 50-day and the 20-day, and that is because the markets are moving really fast these days. I mean, okay, yeah, they're always moving fast. But if you look at the 50-day here, it crossed below the 200-day at the end of March 2020, just off the low. Now, that's a bad whipsaw, and moving averages are trend-following indicators. They're going to lag. They're going to give you whipsaws here, but I think the whipsaws are just a little too deep. And then you can see the 50-day cross back above the 200-day in July, whereas you got a cross a lot earlier in early June, a month earlier with the 5-200-day. So you got to weigh that if you want to have a little bit more sensitivity and catch those signals earlier, uh, or if you want to reduce those whipsaws and catch those signals later. But let's look at how the numbers test it out. So here we have the basic 200-day cross for the first line. Then we got the 5 200 cross for the second line. We've already seen those. And then the third line is going to be the 20 200 cross. And what we're seeing here is we're seeing that performance doesn't improve that much. You can see the compound annual return got up to 5.7% from 5.61, no big deal. Exposure actually went a little bit down. The drawdown was higher. 32.37%, and that's largely the COVID crash. A lot fewer signals, a higher win rate, and yeah, the average gain, average loss was okay, but it's that drawdown here that is of concern. And then if we look at the 50-day crossing above and below the 200-day, we can see how those signals work out. We, again, we can see a modest improvement, modest, a minuscule improvement in the compound annual return, 5.8%. The drawdown up to 34%, a lot fewer trades, a much higher win rate, and an average game to average loss. But as far as I'm concerned, this is the most important column, this maximum drawdown. And if you're using the 5200 cross, your drawdown gets to around 20%. But once you go out to 20 and 50, you got 30 plus percent drawdowns possible. And I would like to just reduce those drawdowns personally, especially if I'm keeping the returns in the same area. Now I want to look at how some other ETFs test with the 5200 cross. And here on Stock Charts ACP, I've got SPY on the top, which you've seen, and the 5200 cross. And then below, I've got QQQ, 
with the 5, 200 cross. And you can see here that QQQ cross, the five day cross below the 200 day, and it stayed below. We didn't get those pokes above the 200 day like we did for SBY in February and in late March, early April. QQQ was showing relative weakness because it couldn't get back above the 200 day. But I want to go back and just test the uh, signals. Now I'm, not t I'm going to have to test the NASDAQ 100 because uh, QQQ and MDY uh, did not have data going back to 2000. So I'm going to test the NASDAQ 100, the S&P mid cap 400, and the S&P small cap 600. So to keep it uniform, I'm going to use the S&P 500 index with the NASDAQ 100, S&P small cap 600, and S&P mid cap 400. And if we look at the NASDAQ 100, we can see it performs pretty well as far as the compound annual return, 7.11%, similar exposure, big drawdown though, 35%, and the win rate was 36%. Uh, but if you want a little more bang for your buck, the NASDAQ 100 is definitely the place to be. Now, if we go down to mid caps, we can see that performance isn't that great. You can see that we only have 4.5% compound annual return, similar exposure, a drawdown of 32%, and a very low win rate, 26%. So the 5200 cross is not working that good for the S&P mid cap 400, and by extension, I would say MDY which is the mid-cap ETF. Then if we look at small caps, we can see that they also do not perform well. The S&P small cap index, 4.19% compound annual return, the lowest of the group. The biggest drawdown, 37.7%, uh, a low win rate. It was better than mid-caps, but worse than um, the NASDAQ 100. And then you can see average gain, average loss, Okay, but, but not, not as good as the other ones. But basically, you have big drawdown and small return for small caps. So it's okay for the NASDAQ, but not so good for mid caps and small caps. But I want to put a twist on this. What if we took the signals from the S&P 500? And instead of buying the S&P 500, we bought the NASDAQ 100 or the mid cap 400 or the small cap 600. How would they perform using signals from the S&P 500? So I'll just review the NASDAQ 100, 5, 200 cross signals before we look at the next one. 7.1% compound annual return, 35% drawdown, 36% win rate. So now what if we turn this around and use the S&P 500 signals for those NASDAQ 100 buy and sell signals? Well, you can see that the compound annual return is similar, 6.8%. The drawdown is similar, 35.62%. But the win rate jumped to 47%. You had a much higher win rate if you use the S&P 500 crosses instead of the NASDAQ 100 crosses. And your return and your drawdown were about the same. So that seems like a positive there to use the S&P 500 signals for trading the NASDAQ 100. So now we're going to go back and we're going to look at the S&P mid-cap 400. And these are the signals using the S&P mid-cap 400 signals. 4.5% compound annual return, 32% drawdown, 26% win rate. So if we use the S&P 500 for signals, you can see, look at that. The return jumps to 7.2%, and the drawdown goes down to 23%, and the win rate to 47%. So clearly, you're better off taking signals from the S&P 500 than from the mid-cap 400. And if you want to trade these, the S&P 500 crosses work a lot better. And you can get that extra beta, that extra outperformance by using the NASDAQ 100 and the mid-cap 400 as your trading vehicle. Now let's look at small caps. So here is the S&P small cap index. And you can see with the 5, 200 cross, 4.2% return, 38% drawdown roughly, 34% win rate. So not very good. And if instead we used signals from the S&P 500, you can see an improvement in performance. 7% compound annual return, maximum drawdown under 30%, and a 50% win rate. So I think in every case here, the NASDAQ 100, the S&P mid cap 400, and the S&P small cap 600, you're better off using the S&P 500 for signals. And by extension, I almost think, especially for the uh, S&P 
uh, mid cap 400 and S&P small cap 600 and the Russell 2000 by extension, I think you can just ignore crosses of the 200 day for those three. Small caps and mid caps, forget crosses of the 200 day, forget five 200 day crosses, just ignore them. Use that five 200 cross for the S&P 500. For the NASDAQ 100, okay, maybe there's a case for the five 200 cross, but still, it works better when you use those signals from the S&P 500 applied to the NASDAQ 100. Because the S&P 500, if you think about it, is the most widely followed index out there. The 200 day is the most widely followed moving average. And so if you can get on that bandwagon there, the most widely followed benchmark, the most widely used moving average, and use that for your broad market timing and then go into the higher beta ETFs, I think you're going to outperform than if you use the actual ETFs for your signals. So here's a chart example using SPY in the top window and IJR, the S&P small cap 600 ETF in the lower window. And the idea is you would take signals based on SPY crosses and ignore signals based on IJR crosses. Now, IJR here crossed below the 200-day before the S&P 500 had some whipsaws, but had its ultimate cross there in late January and then the S&P 500 got it in January, too, but had some whipsaws. I mean, not every signal is going to be perfect, uh, but you can also see small caps were underperforming in February, March, April, because that five-day didn't get above the 200-day. And then if we look here in August, we got a five-day cross above the 200-day in IJR, but it's turning out to be a whipsaw, at least so far, because you can see SBY is not crossed above its 200-day. So in a way, IJR is showing some relative strength, but as long as SPY is below its 200-day, the five days below the 200-day, I'm staying away from IJR, MDY, QQQ, because the S&P 500 is the benchmark for U.S. stocks, the most widely followed. And when the five days below the 200-day, you're more likely to have negative outcomes than positive outcomes. In other words, downside than upside. So if you'd like to know more about TrendInvestorPro.com, you can click on the link below in the description. Again, if you like this video, please give us a thumbs up and consider subscribing to Stock Charts. Thanks again for tuning in. Have a great day, and I'll talk to you again next week. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.